The panel will be discussing how these transformational changes can be used by cable operators um, and address new opportunities and use cases that can result in better quality of service and um, user uh, experience uh, to, the, to the customers. So there are two papers uh, that the panelists have written. Each of them have written uh, one paper. I highly encourage you to read the papers. They're extremely good and it'll give you uh, some detailed background on both Wi-Fi 6 and the new 6 gigahertz spectrum and how operators, uh, how uh, cable operators can use the, the technology in the new spectrum for you know, new opportunities. So now I'd like to introduce, introduce our panel. Uh, Dave Urban is with Comcast and he's a uh, distinguished engineer and he's been working with Comcast for 15 years working on DOCSIS 3.0, DOCSIS 3.1, and uh, Xfinity Wi-Fi. And he's also, currently he's working on cable modem a wireless gateway. And in the past, in his past lives, he's worked at AT&T Bell Labs and uh, ITS and ADC. He holds a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Penn State, and a bachelor, uh, a BA in physics from uh, Edinburgh uh, University of Pennsylvania. And our next panelist is um, J.R. Uh, Flesch, and he is a director of advanced technologies um, from in the office of the CTO at Comscope. Whoops. <clears throat> and um, J.R. has over 40 years in communication, electronics, and systems uh, background um, in the industry and he has a BS uh, in electrical engineering uh, uh, degree and two, sp two postgraduate degrees, uh, one in uh, double E and one in computer science. And he's worked over 30 years in uh, cable-related businesses with um, product work in um, high-efficiency Wi-Fi and wireless, and uh, he's worked with and managed advanced development teams for Google, Motorola, Eris, and Comscope. So uh, thank you both for coming. And uh, the format of the panel is to, we have an hour for this uh, workshop. So the first 20 minutes will be, the panelists will uh, present their slides and then we'll leave about five, 10 minutes for questions and then we'll go, go to the next panelist. So I just wanted to mention that. And so um, now I'll introduce Dave, who, who will go into the details and development of Wi-Fi 6 standards and why uh, high efficiency is vital for uh, operators who want to deliver um, uh, gigabit services over Wi-Fi in the home. So this paper is on Applying Wi-Fi 6 technology for the delivery of gigabit per second internet service. Um, when we developed DOCSIS 3.1, it was all about being able to deliver it at one gigabit per second on the downstream. And I remember early on, one of the things that bothered me was folks would tell me, well, what good does it do to have a one gigabit per second service if the customer is not downloading one gigabit per second on their computers. And so we were, you know, very excited when Intel came out with the 9260 uh, Wi-Fi card that had a 2 by 2 160 megahertz um, station and we could finally deliver one gigabit per second service to customers' computers. And now with, with Wi-Fi 6 technology, we can expand that to more devices and, and particularly make it more reliable and make it whole home coverage. So in my paper, I wanted to start with the, the, the tra understanding the traffic demand. First, first, I think you the important thing is to understand the traffic demand and then make sure the capacity that you're providing the customer is much, much larger than, than the demand. It shouldn't just be a game of, you know, who can run the, 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 the greatest amount of iPerf streams in a home. It should be start with what the customer is doing. And this, this is a measurement of um, actually a fairly low end. This is, this is a little dongle 
HDMI dongle you stick in your computer. Um, it's a Fire Stick from Amazon. It's only 2.4 gigahertz, and but this is this is the measure. This is an Ultra HD signal, and the average speed is about five to six megabits per second. But it's not a continuous five megabits per second. It's it it peaks basically every four or five millis. This is a one mi minute interval, and there's about you know 11 peaks. Peaks go up as high as the the Wi-Fi technology will allow. If we had an AX technology, it might go to 100 or 200 megabits per second. But it's but the the video streaming is basically about peaking and buffering. The the uh, next application is a file download. So so in video streaming, you're never really going to get a gigabit per second. Um, but but if you but this but in a but with a a Wi-Fi 6 160 megahertz card and a, a CMTS configuration with a max TR rate of 1250. Um, you can run a speed test over Wi-Fi to a, to a computer, um, and you can get 1200 megabits per second on the downstream, 40 megabits per second on the upstream. This just happens to be this the CMTS. Uh, class of service that it was set to to over a live plant in in my home, um, and one of the things that that I also, you know, I think speed tests are a very important application because they kind of you know you're always going to get, you know, Dad, why is the Wi-Fi not working? And you don't know if it's the Wi-Fi or the internet or your cable service. So being able to do a speed test and know, well, okay, I'm getting 1,200 megabits per second down over my Wi-Fi, so the cable modem's working, the Wi-Fi's working, whatever problem you're, we're having is something other than Wi-Fi or the cable modem. Um, but if the speed test is the only application that can download at 1,200 megabits per second, then it's kind of a useless measurement. So we'd hope that there's other applications. and. Sure enough, um, there are some websites. This happened to be from Microsoft downloading a 4.4 gigabyte file. Um, and I was able to download a 4.4 gigabyte file in 30 seconds using a, a station with a 2400 megabit per second file rate. Um, this, is, this is, I call this the you know, field of dreams uh, strategy. You know, if you build it, they will come. And just like we saw when we first offered a 10 megabit per second internet, internet service or a 50 megabit per second internet service or 100 megabit per second, um, a year ago at this same site, you would download it about 200 megabits per second. Today, you can download it 1.1 gigabit per second. Not all sites will allow you to do that, but, but, but more and more sites, once, once you offer a one gigabit per second service, guess what, the folks on the other side start taking advantage of it much quicker than you expect. And that is the case with one gigabit per second um, internet service offering. Um, in, our, in our work, we have found that 160 megahertz is really the key to one gigabit per second service. We tried for years and years to do it on 80 megahertz. We had four by fours. We had actually the same fire rate. We had devices that were 1733 megabit per second fire rate. We had devices that were 2100 megabit per second fire rate, but they just never even delivered 900 megabits per second because trying to get four facial streams in an 80 megahertz channel is just hard. Trying to get two spatial streams in a 160 megahertz channel with a little dinky 2x2 two two M.2 card turns out to be very easy. And not only, not only close range, but at very large distances, basically across your home. It's not going to get every nook and cranny, but you can get a, a solid one gigabit per second service. You'll, we'll see some of the data. Um, in a bit, but it, it works at very good range, and, and 160 megahertz turns out to be a key to that. This, this shows you, this is, if you look at this chart, it's 800 megahertz span, so each division is 80 megahertz, so you can see it fills up about two divisions, so that's your 160 megahertz signal. Um, 1024 qualm is the highest uh, modulation rate in, 
in Wi-Fi 6. It's optional. There were some proprietary 1024 QAM offerings at, um, at, uh, in, in Wi-Fi 5 or AC. Um, never really caught on, never really, really worked all that well because once, when you're doing proprietary methods, it's, it's just you know, never as good when it's part of the standard. Even though it's optional, most, most devices are, are, are doing 1024 QAM. Um, this, um, the, the key point here is that the 1024 QAM delivers 10 bits in every, in every subcarry. We'll use that in the formula to calculate the data rates. Um, another thing to notice is the minus 41 dB EVM. Uh, the standard allows for minus 35 dB EVM being about 6 dB higher than the standard at um, in the AP. That means coming out of the of the of the transmitter is very critical to delivering um, the higher MCS 11 at range. If you if you if you just barely meet the IEEE standard minus 35. It'll work at close range, but at distances you'll struggle to get MCS 11. We find that actually with the with the Samsung S10, which is the first Wi-Fi 6 uh, phone, and with the AX200, which are in uh, computers uh, today, such as the XPS 11, the new uh, XPS 13. I'm sorry from Dell. Um, we find that getting MCS 11 actually at pretty good range is is, is not, not very hard, even with two spatial streams. Um, this, this, the, the FFT size of AX for a 160 megahertz is, is 2048. There's, it takes 2048 points to create one FFT and an OFDM symbol. And that's a, important to realize because um, it's much more complex than, than AC. In the AC world, it was one-fourth of that. It was, it was five, 512 points. So AC comes, the Wi-Fi 6 comes at a cost. The cost is, you know, much more complexity in the, in the uh, creation of an OFDM symbol. Hopefully that, you know, Moore's Law works in our favor there. So the reason I show this slide is that you can see that the highest carrier is 1012 and the lowest subcarrier is minus 1012. So that spans, you know, 20, 20, 24 subcarriers are, are shown in this plot. So that tells you it's a 2048 point FFT. Now, it doesn't know the whole, all of the 2048 points in the, uh, the subcarriers are not lit up. So, so there's a guard band on the left side, there's a guard band on the right side, there's, there's some nulls in the middle. So, you know, all of the 28, 2048 points are not active subcarriers. In this case, the active subcarriers range over, you know, from 10, 10, 12 to minus 10, 12. Another thing to notice is that we are, the radio standard is AX160, so you're looking at the, the, the spectral flatness of an AX160 signal. Uh, this is 1024 qualm modulation. <clears throat> Notice that the subcarrier spacing is 312.5. So that's that's the until Wi-Fi 6, until AX, all from G to N to AC, the subcarrier spacing was always 312.5 kilohertz. <clears throat> and that's still true in AX for for the, the preambles and the, the RTS, CTS, a lot of the messaging, but when you actually send the data, the, the, the data portion, the data symbols in the AX signal are not spaced by 312 kilohertz, they're spaced by 78.125 kilohertz. So one, the, the, the subcarriers are, 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 the subcarrier spacing is shrunk by one fourth from 312 to 78. That's that's important because as the as the when the sub this is the other disadvantage of the AX and that is it's more subject to phase noise. So as the subcarriers get closer together, phase noise has a bigger impact. And so essentially, you need to do Wi-Fi six. You need a much more complex um, computing to do a 1024 
uh, 2048 point FFT and with, with subcarrier spacings of 78.125, um, you need much better LO with lower phase noise. Now, if you compare this to like LTE, LTE has 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. So we don't require the same, you know, um, quality of a radio as an LTE, but, but we're getting closer. Because um, one, one of the advantages of the 312 was our, our Wi-Fi chips could be cheaper and simpler. They didn't have to be as good as a cellular radio. Um, now we're getting a lot of the technology of cellular radio, but it also is now incumbent of us to, to get you know, that kind of quality. And then this is why we actually find that Wi-Fi 6 devices actually work much better. Wi-Fi 6 AP actually makes AC devices work a lot better. Well, why would that be? It's, it, it's, how, how does it, how does a, AX make an AC work better. Well, when you have to meet all these specifications, you have to have a better radio, and it turns out having a better radio actually makes everything work better. Um, another thing to notice is the guard interval is 1 16th. Um, and this is really the key to high efficiency. In, in, in AC world, at least with a normal 800 nanosecond subcarrier, um, the, the, the guard interval was one-fourth. So 25% of your, your air time was just chewed up putting space between OFDM symbols. Here it's one-sixteenth. So instead of 25%, you're down to like 6% of, to, of time being used just to, just to keep prevent inter-symbol interference. So I, if you remember nothing from this talk, um, Remember the number 600. If you can remember the number 600, it's actually useful. You can, you can very quickly kind of figure out all the fire rates and how the fire rates of different devices correspond to channel width and number of antennas and stuff. So, so this is how 600 is, is derived. Um, so we start with the, the 160 megahertz channel width. If we want to create an OFDM symbol with a 160 megahertz channel width, I take 1 over 160 and I get 6.25. That means when I create my FFT, the, the time samples are going to be 6.25 nanoseconds apart. Now, I need to have, again, with OFDM, we have to have some kind of guard interval. We have to have some kind of space between two symbols or they're just, you'll get inner symbol interference. You'll get a reflection off the wall and you'll end up getting two symbols at once. So we, we, we select 800 nanoseconds for, for two reasons. So first of all, light travels one foot and one nanosecond. So if I have an object that's 400 feet away and it it's, takes 400 nanoseconds to get there, 400 nanoseconds to get back, it's gonna hit me with an 800 nanosecond delay. And we think about 400 feet away from your home, you're probably going outside, you're going through trees, you're going through walls. The signal that bounces off something 400 feet away is gonna be pretty far down. And, and signals that are further, but reflecting off things that are further than 400 feet are really gonna be down. So, so just logic would tell you that 800 nanosecond is, um, cyclic prefix or guard interval is probably enough. Um, if it's not enough for things like you know, our docks is 3.1 where we need five microseconds because we have 3,000 feet long, you know, distances between amplifiers or a cellular tower that's, you know, going miles. Uh, those things need much longer guard intervals. 400 nanoseconds is fine. It, we also know it's going to work because, man, we've been doing this since 11G days and so far it's worked pretty good for us. So. We're keeping, keeping the same 800 nanosecond cyclic prefix makes a lot of sense. So if we take the 800 nanoseconds divided by 6.25 nanoseconds, we get 128. That means that we're gonna have to have 128 time samples basically of nothing, of dummy, dummy re repetition uh, between every symbol. Now, <clears throat> that determines our FFT size only thing we need to know, remember that one sixteenth that was that was in there. So, I mean, if we make the if we make the FFT size one twenty eight, then um, it's very inefficient because we're going to be have one hundred twenty eight of nothing and then one hundred twenty eight of FFT. Um, so we want to make it as large as possible relative to 
the cyclic prefix. So if we take 128 over 116th, we get 2048. So that's, that's why we're using a 2048 point FFT that you saw earlier. Now, if we take the, the 6.25 nanosecond, the time between um, FFT uh, sampling spaces and we multiply it by the FFT size, we get 12.8 microseconds. So the, the useful symbol time or this FFT duration, it takes 12.8 microseconds to create an OFDM symbol. Now, we take that 12.8, we add the guard interval, we get 13.6. So, so a, a symbol period is 13.6 microseconds. Why do I want to know that? I want to know that because if I'm going to calculate the data rate, I have to divide it by the symbol period. So the 13.6 is the denominator in my equation for data rate. Um, the, 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 um, the, the other, the, 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 the subcarrier spacing is calculated by taking the inverse of the useful symbol time. So that's where the 78.125 kilohertz comes from. It's one, basically 1 over 1, 12.8 microseconds. Now, all we need to know to calculate the data rate is the number of subcarriers that are actual data subcarriers. The, the, if we do 1024 QAM, it's 10 bits per, per subcarrier. And we have an LDPC code that's 5.6. So all we need to do is figure out how many, how many subcarriers. Now, I, I did a little ch jump here. We've been talking about the 160 megahertz, but I'm going to jump to 80 megahertz because it turns out that in, 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 in Wi-Fi 6, 160 megahertz is really just two side-by-side -side 80 megahertz. In fact, you can actually demodulate. If you take a 160 megahertz sig signal and you only have an 80 megahertz demodulator, you can just demodulate the lower half, demodulate the upper half. They're, they're literally two side-by-side -side 80 megahertz channels. So, so I, I, I calculate the number of data subcarriers. We know we have a 1024 point FFT for 80 megahertz. We have to have 12 lower guard band, 11 upper guard band, and five DC uh, null carriers, as well as 16 pilots. That's where we get the 980 um, data subcarrier. So if we take 980 times 10 times 56 divided by 136, you get 600. So 600 megabits per second is 80 megahertz, one spatial stream. So when you buy your Samsung S10 or your new uh, iPhone 11, those are two by two. So you're going to multiply it by two. You're going to get 600 times two, 1200. Those are 1200 megabit per second phi. And if you have a 1200 megabit per second phi, you're not going to get 1200 megabit per second, but you can get 800 megabit per second when you do a speed test with your new iPhone 11 or your Samsung S10. If you buy the computer with the AX200 in it, now it has it has two spatial streams. Six times 600 times two is 1200, but it's 160 megahertz. So 1200 becomes 2400. So with the AX200, you got a 2400 megabit per second um, phi rate. So you can get, you know, getting the 1.2 gigabit per second is pretty easy with a 1200 megabit per second um, phi rate. The, when you go to the Best Buy and you look at the routers, you'll see a lot of them say, oh, 4800 megabit per second phi. Well, that's, that means they have four spatial streams, 160 megahertz. So you take your 600, multiply it by four, and then multiply it by two, you get 4800. Let me skip ahead to some of the measurements in the homes. Um, yeah, the, the, the fun stuff is the measurements in the homes. So, so are we able to deliver one gigabit per second whole home coverage? Well, pretty, pretty close. In, in, in the family room, which is an adjacent room, I get 1.5 gigabit per second. And in, in these one, two, three, four, five rooms, I'm actually doing the, the maximum fire rate, 2,400 megabits per second. Can't do any better than that. And that's basically, the same room, adjacent room, upstairs, downstairs, you can, in, in those locations that are reasonably close, you can expect to get the full 2400 megabit per second fire rate. And so we're easily getting, you know, over a gigabit per second. The nice thing about it is that you don't have to be, you, 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 you don't have to be um, 
at the full MCS 11 to still get a gigabit per second. So, so in, in my daughter's room, that's actually a pretty tough spot. And that is, that is in a different floor on the opposite side of the house um, through many walls. And, and the fire rate has dropped to, this is actually MCS 6. But I'm still getting, because of the AX efficiency and because of the, of the um, 160 megahertz channel width, even at MCS 6, I still get a 1300 megabit per second fire rate, and I still get a 911 megabit per second download rate. And so, so we're getting whole home coverage. Um, in the worst case, I think we're getting goes down to maybe 600 megabits per second. Or actually, when we go outside, or in the, in the far corner, in the nook and cranny, we go down to 230 megabits per second. So. Great. <clears throat> okay, we're running out of time. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, very insightful um, talk, and I, I think for me, it's really uh, nice to get uh, to, to get into the details of the uh, RF behind 11AX because it gives you a healthy appreciation of how Wi-Fi has gone from uh, the 11G days to 11AC to now. And you can see how it's getting closer to, you could argue that it's getting closer to LTE and the, and the mobile uh, devices, but the trade-offs are, of course, you know, the inexpensive cost of that they're trying to attain with Wi-Fi um, and also um, you know trying to keep it simple but there's some powerful um, you know math and um, radio uh, technology behind this so um, as, as Dave said um, if you remember anything just remember that 600 uh, megabits per second um, uh, piece there and there's also going to be a quiz uh, before you go <laughs> So uh, I'll open the floor to some questions. Um, if anybody has questions, please uh, go to the microphone. Um, and while we wait, I just have one or two questions and then we'll move on to um, JR's talk. But um, the first question is, and, and Dave, you didn't go too much into OFDMA, which is another um, big feature that 11AX has over uh, 11AC. Um, and so the question is, you know, is Wi-Fi Six continues to mature and become commercially available. What would you say is the most important uh, feature to cable operators as they deploy use Wi-Fi six in the home um, and MDUs? Right. So the presentation does cover OFDMA. Um, the paper covers it a little bit. Mostly the theory of OFDMA because we're still struggling with really getting it to work. So it's 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 going to take a few years before we work out the details of OFDMA, before we get set-tops and cameras. So the real value of OFDMA is when we get set-tops and cameras that have the AX technology. Um, but, that, but that's a key. And, and one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons that I, I, I put my first slide was the little video streaming, because it seems like that's pretty darn easy. We're able to do 1,200 megabits per second on a speed test, and yet this little dinky streaming thing is only doing five or six megabit per second average, and maybe peaks to 20. But darn it, if if you have a room full of set-top boxes, um, you run a speed test, and you get macro blocking, so, so things that are being done on computers are impacting the set-top boxes, and then, the, and then when you have four or five set-top boxes and they're a little bit far away, uh, guess what, you don't get 1,200 on a speed test anymore. So what we're seeing with AC technology is even, even smaller um, data demands of like a set-top box or a camera can, can, can chew up a significant amount of, of your resources, and with OFDMA, you can have one camera or you can have four cameras. It doesn't matter because they're all, you, when you send to those cameras, it's all going to be part of an OFDMA group. So, so you, it'll, you'll be able to add cameras without impacting the network. And those cameras won't have to do 80 megahertz with four spatial streams anymore. They'll, they'll be able to do a small RU. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. So, um, as we move on to um, JR's talks, um, just so the segue is, so what Dave has done is, is kind of explained, you know, the, the technology and, and the technical background of 11AX and what it offers, you know, OFDMA, higher, um, higher modulation, so you have a higher data rate. And 
you can do a lot with what he demonstrated with the last slide, is you can do a lot with 160 megahertz bandwidth with 11AX. And you can see that even though you had a lower MCS index, you could kind of go to most of the house and you had over one gigabit per second service. So as we, so now we've talked about the, the technology, there's new spectrum that's opening in the six gigahertz band um, and there's 1,200 megahertz of, of, of uh, available spectrum. So what JR uh, uh, from Comscope is going to be addressing is, well, how, do you, how does an operator um, use, how do, how do they deploy um, access points in a home to achieve an, uh, um, you know, whole, whole home coverage, and how do you utilize uh, 11X in the home environment? So with that, um, JR. Morning. Okay, before we get started, how many folks bought into the notion that uh, your hotel was walking distance away from the exposition center? <laughs> okay, and, and how many of you, like me, forgot that uh, summer lasts in New Orleans about uh, 10 months? <laughs> yeah, okay, just wanted to check on that. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about uh, 6 gigahertz. 6 gigahertz is a great thing. Um, if I need to make a statement, I'm going to get down over here. If you take away nothing else from this talk, take away the notion that 6 gigahertz provides the potential for 1.2 gig of bandwidth, as you recall from, from today's talk, at an NCS of 11, that's around 10 bits per second per mm -hmm. spectrum density. That's a lot of bit rate. So it, it, you're going to have to pay attention to anything. Okay, just kidding. We really probably ought to talk about some other things. Um, motivation for, for why we worry about bit rate. Aside from the most important motivation, which is that your boss told you to do it, there are things going on in the world which motivate us to want to construct in-home wireless coverage that spans a gigahertz and beyond. Uh, the first driver for this is that the existing arrangements that we've got at 2.4 and 5 gig, they're getting crowded. And they're getting crowded with the legacy of Max, which spans several different tech epochs and unfortunately causes our APs to have to fall back to least common denominator type of service considerations for servicing clients that are potentially slow about responding to things or not willing to take up the yoke and, and actually do fun things in, in uh, FDMA space. So these are all considerations. <coughs> the other thing is marketing stuff. I love marketing stuff. Um, that CAGR is pretty accurate, folks. That's 30% compound annual growth rate for bit rate. And if you look on this thing, what's driving it is smaller devices that are demanding higher streaming services. I don't think that surprises any of us, right? But that video demand, both on large and small screens, have us demanding the gigabit, gigabit service, and that's for the coming year or two, not even yet anticipating the demands past that, uh, where VR and AR systems will demand much, much higher uh, and much denser coverages. Uh, the other piece of this is that we share some ISM band down on the low end, in particular 2.4, with IoT devices. And there's a lot of machine-to-machine -machine communications that are going to be happening as IoT devices get placed in homes and we start automating more and more of what goes on there. There are other considerations for quality of life uh, that include aging in place and health where, um, as you can imagine, um, taking care of aging parents uh, I would be one of those, I wish my kids were here, um, would be a requirement that demands us to share potentially life-threatening requirements in an ISM band that's getting crowded. So you'll, you'll see that anything we can do to help pull high-rate 
Wi-Fi services away from 2.4 and put it in more advantageous spectral space it could potentially be the right thing to do. The takeaway here is the blue boxes here is the growth in consumer IoT. And you'll notice by just next year um, how that growth, that's a 6x growth over what it was just five years ago. Okay, um, uh, the notice for rulemaking. Um, just to give you an idea of what the FCC is considering, and by the way, we're not expecting a decision um, this year probably on this, but the notions have been floated and presented to the FCC about splitting up the six gigahertz band, which is Uni 5 up through Uni 8, into both high power and what are called LPI, uh, low power indoor pieces of the band. The notion is that for the higher powers, radiated powers uh, at a watt or so, up through four watts potentially, I guess, um, there would be a requirement to be aware as an AP what fixed wireless infrastructure might be around the home so that you didn't interfere with legacy systems, right? It's just all the good neighbor consideration. But if you're going to do low power stuff, the notion is maybe we don't need to do AFC. Now, AFC, just as an aside, is a system similar to SAS on uh, CBRS. And if you don't know what these things are, they're fundamentally detection and database schemes for knowing where other guys might be transmitting, okay? And it requires an in-place, sort of an in-line consideration as a dynamic spectral ask, where can I operate and how much bandwidth do I get when I do that? Okay, just a quick talk on this slide because I, I want to keep my time under control here. There have been various performance eras recently for, for technologies that have come out. I mean, we've gotten to the RRM, the remote radio management notion. You'll see people who are advising you that they have cloud-based systems that can help uh, channel select for you in your existing Wi-Fi arrangements and improve your throughputs. There is Wi-Fi 6, which uh, we just went through. Uh, as providing potentially denser and more airtime um, uh, capable uh, transmissions. And then we've got this notion of six gigahertz where we can take what Wi-Fi wi 6 promises by way of OFDMA, um, uh, beam forming, um, um, it's very high dense spectral usage and put it in a band which is largely open and uncontended. Um, so I'm going to zip through this one a little bit. The um, Wi-Fi 6 products in general are, are new. Um, so one of the issues that we mentioned in the, in the previous discussion was you don't get all the benefits of Wi-Fi 6 unless you've actually got the AP, which controls the scheduling for how Wi-Fi is used, and you got a client that is Wi-Fi 6 aware and can take advantage of the band. So first things first, as Wi-Fi 6 rolls out, even in the legacy bands, you're not going to get huge jumps in performance, as we were alluding to. It's, it's going to be a sort of a step-by-step -step process, and you're going to have to cleanse the existing client populations in order to get the full benefit. But the fun thing is, at 6 gigahertz, the ante, the table stakes for playing in 6 gigahertz are you have to be Wi-Fi 6 compliant. Aha! Now that's kind of cool because it means everybody that gets into 6 gigahertz has to know what you're talking about when you talk about an MCS 11 that gets me 1024 qualm, has to know what OFDMA means in terms of GI can schedule acts on return paths quickly has to understand the beamforming implications of reaching out to different clients very quickly. So this is a very important bonding. It's really important at 6 gigahertz that you got to be Wi-Fi 6 compliant or you don't get to play. All right, so a quick uh, example of, of what Wi-Fi 6 on 6 gigahertz is going to mean. Typically in homes, you've got your WAN connection, however your service provider gets you signal. If you're not a fixed wireless customer, it's going to be at the edge of the house, and typically in the basement, something like that. So 
If you've got a single gateway and you're wanting to get wireless coverage, I think everyone is familiar with the notion that you, you know, it works great downstairs in the family room. It kind of works okay on the first floor, but in the farthest bedroom, and most likely it's the most vocal child, it doesn't seem to work very well, okay? So we have to address that. And the way we address it is we go, hey, it's going to be very easy to go from a gateway access at the corner of the house in the far corner where, you know, yes, people gather and everything else, but gee, you got to live everywhere in the home. And we put an access point, an extender type, we, we reserve for it a pipeline at six gigahertz, which allows us to front and backhaul signal to this device, which is strategically located in the middle of the house, has six gigahertz Wi-Fi six coverage capability, and now can grab in clients from all over, get that return signal and, and front haul hauled to the devices and back from the devices to the edge device in the home. And this, folks, is the killer application for six gigahertz in homes. And I've got several slides here in the interest of moving along. They simply hammer home the notion that, um, yeah, backbone the homes in different ways with six gigahertz and you will build yourself a capability which allows you to take the promise of what Dave was mentioning about Wi-Fi 6, put it in a band where there's nothing else there and not kind of sort of get to a gigahertz but get multiple gigahertz coverages. This is, uh, just discusses what's in the paper. Uh, I invite you, you folks to uh, actually read the paper. Uh, my boss and I have a bet. He says no one will ever read it. I'm hoping at least somebody does. It's, I read it. You did? I read it. I win. This, it's already, it's a, it's really good. this is a perfect day, okay. Um, so let's dive into some of the tests and stuff that, that uh, we performed in order to validate the notion that you can do this backboning idea. At the time we did this, uh, we only had access to AC devices, but we did manage to steer them up to the uh, upper part of uh, Uni 4, which abuts the uh, four Uni bands associated with six gigahertz. So we would have a notion that from a propagation standpoint, we would be getting close to identifying the lumped element uh, uh, transfer losses associated with interior walls and flooring, right? It's always a consideration as opposed to just basic distance. And so there were several test cases where in a three-level home, uh, which Comscope owns, um, which is a test house for, for Wi-Fi, it's a 5,000 square foot, they say average American home, um, three levels, basement level, upper and lower, and we simply took cases where we had APs and clients and we distributed them around the home and made measurements, okay? Uh, this is the top to bottom levels. You'll notice we've got a, uh, an extremely long diagonal there from the pool room, uh, which when I first heard about it, I was very excited, but it was relayed to me that this was in fact just a billiards area and not actually a wet zone. Um, so there up to the upper floor corner, and this is called case six, and we'll go through all these other cases. You'll notice there's several room-to-room -room cases on the top level. There's an upper floor to lower floor case, which is case three. There's a two-wall case, which is uh, case two, all right? And we'll take a look at some of the data in terms of what kind of throughput were we getting with AC equipment, okay, Wi-Fi 5-based equipment at the upper end of Uni 4 okay, which is very close to the six gigahertz band. And so we did this at several powers just to get a feel for what kind of punch we would get across the home. And if you want to look at the most pathological case at the bottom there, K6, that's a 60 foot throw. It's through two floors and two walls. And you notice if we boosted the power up to 400 milliwatts, we were still able to get about 240 megabit per second. <coughs> that's not bad. 
You'll see if we wanted to be more responsible about our powers, though, run it down at 200 or, or 100, uh, there was a, a pretty steep decline there. We were approaching just 100 megabit, but, and these are uh, TCP, so this is running roughly 10% or so below the UDP rates and, and maybe as much as 30% below the, which you might get if you wanted to look at absolute phis. But it was done with a, a 4x4, so four spatial streams. Okay. Um, so, uh, what does Wi-Fi 6 in a 6 gigahertz band tend to mean? Well, forgive the horizontal scaling on this, but the point I was trying to make a point here, if you look at it across all of the frequencies up at 6 gig where you go from uni 5 up through uni 8 bands, those would be all the color-coded pieces there, so from 5.8 gig up to about seven and just above, um, out to about 100 meters without any walls or floors to worry about, so 250 feet, give or take, a uh, little more, you're getting over two gigabit per second uh, as a UDP at 250 milliwatts. This is a fairly responsible EIRP for an, for an AP. You see, you can still receive signal all the way out to a kilometer away and you're still getting close to 100 megabit per second. Not that I know of any homes that are a kilometer <laughs> wide. Okay, uh, three, three little charts here to describe, to, to kind of get a feel for what uh, having six, six gigahertz capability versus, versus five. So this is a chart that uh, allows you to take a look at uh, a 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi 5, but a very high power. We're going to run one watt with it, so we're going to kind of bias this thing so it's got, you know, we're going to feel sorry for it that it's only running Wi-Fi 5, and then we're going to take a Wi-Fi 6, and at the lower or higher end of the band, at uni 5 or 8, we're going to run it down at 250 milliwatts. And you see that even though it's down there for, for a throw from the AP up to 55 feet and through one wall, you get a 50% higher bit rate out of the Wi-Fi 6, even though it's 6 dB lower power than the Wi-Fi 5. Now, eventually, power wins out, right? I mean, you can't do it forever, and, and you know, as you get farther and farther away and the losses mount, well, power does eventually win out. You traverse the MCS in similar fashions on, on both APs, and, you know, Power, at the end of the day, power wins. So now we're going to look at, well, okay, so what if we did, um, we put Wi-Fi 6 in at the, at the 5 gigahertz, and we gave it a watt, and we compared it to the 6 gigahertz Wi-Fi 6 at the 250 milliwatt. Well, so when they're both at MCS 11, you get the same kind of throughputs, right? Fairly close, up to about 25 foot and a wall away. They both look the same, higher, lower power, doesn't matter. But... After you get a little bit farther, start punching through more f floors and walls, the, the higher power Wi-Fi 6 does perform better. I don't think there's anything surprising about that. But let's take a look at what happens if we acknowledge that at 5 gigahertz, you've got a, more contention than you do at 6. There's basically no clients out there at 6 gigahertz right now, so you've got no one arguing with you about how to use the bandwidth or anything else. But at 5, you've got a lot of legacy devices with legacy different Wi-Fi Max, and so we're going to assign this maybe a 30% contention factor. And if we do that, what happens is you get this little piece. Now, even though you're at one watt in Wi-Fi 6, you don't do anywhere near as well as the lower power at 6 gigahertz. And that's, again, because there's no contention up there. Again, no contention. They power always wins. You have some contention, which is the actual case with 5 gigahertz, and this is what happens to you. All right, I'm going to, uh, there, uh, the simple thing to, to note here and, and for further reading is there was a, an exercise we did adding Wi-Fi 6 capability on a 6 gigahertz trunk to an existing simulation which had both 
uh, bitrate traffic down at the old 11N epoch at 2.4 and had a fair amount, 400 megabits in fact, at uh, Wi-Fi 5 traffic in 5 gigahertz. And we added a, a several uh, client elements, new Wi-Fi 6. So this would be a home which already was experiencing very high traffic and we went to a gateway and an extender which both had the ability to exploit the 6 gigahertz band. Long story short, even though we had a huge demand on the trunk going from the gateway out to the extender, some 550 megahertz, we actually had the capability with that 6 gigahertz trunk to support 1.8 gigabit per second. And understand this was only a four spatial stream setup at 160 megahertz. Depending on what the FCC does, we might be able to exploit 320 megahertz bandwidths, and we certainly can go up already to eight spatial streams if we so desire. But that's a 31% use of that trunk. And you'll notice circled here, circled here is a um, uh, relatively pathological case where we stuck a high demand HDR UHD television um, some 50 feet away going through a couple of walls demanding 70 megabit per second streaming uh, support and with only a two by two radio arrangement in there, we were able to meet that 70 and in fact, we could have gone to 222 megabit per second if we had required it. That's the power of Wi-Fi 6 at 6 gig. All right, a couple of quick closing comments. If you go into smaller dwellings, MDUs, the average uh, apartment in the United States is 900 square feet. You can afford to get coverage in that piece using only 50 milliwatt radios. And in this particular case, uh, it, it shows a service radius of 28 feet and three walls in the apartment, and you're still able to light up the far end client to over 130 megabit per second. Um, Side, sidebar here on OBSS and BSS coloring. Um, MDUs in particular, this is the case you get where you've got uh, uh, a single apartment in the middle is gonna be your point of highest uh, co-channel interference because it gets c contributions from all the adjacent units and also most importantly from the units directly above and directly below. And finally, uh, last thing, coexistence. So. Uh, the reason you'll, you'll hear some considerations from the FCC based on legacy pieces is that, yes, uh, if you're not careful about the way you radiate in the home, you get inside-out propagation from the home to the local terrain, and it potentially could cause some issues. But we'll put some numbers to that. If you've got a worst-case wood-siding home, wood's not a big knockdown of, of mid-gigahertz signals, you've got a 250 milliwatt gateway in there radiating away, the radius of potential CCI can be 2,300 meters. The best case would be if you had lower power, you had your AP in the middle of a small stone home, and in that particular one, uh, if you're only running 100 milliwatts and stone is a tremendous uh, Faraday shield, um, the potential CCI doesn't even get out of the yard. So if you look at the geometric mean of these things, you say, ah, we might have a consideration for up to 300 meters away from a tower which was supporting this. But the last piece of the puzzle is the antenna structures have to align. And typically the, the, the uh, microwave towers have horns with uh, sub 120 degree acceptance angles associated with them. And most importantly, they're polarized in such a way to avoid Fresnel issues with ground bounce and that kind of thing. But you would have to have the home antenna and the microwave antenna conspire to meet each other. And we're assigning that roughly a one out of six time. So one out of six times that you're inside 300 meters, you might sort of kind of have an opportunity for interference. And that's it. Okay. Thanks, JR. And uh, thanks for the excellent insight into the different deployment scenarios and how to use Wi-Fi 6 in 6 gigahertz bands. There's a lot of trade-offs and a lot of uh, um, comparisons um, with Wi-Fi 5 and 6 with the power and the location. 
um, and, 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 and different other things. So I'll open the floor to questions. Um, we're kind of running out of time, so if there aren't any questions, I would like to ask everyone to thank uh, Dave Urban of Comcast and J.R. Flesh of Comscope um, for their excellent work, and, uh, and I encourage everyone to please read the, the papers as well. It's, uh, it's very good. Thank you, guys.